Hey, hey, I'm Shay Warner, and you are listening to Casual Cattle Conversations. If you are ready to explore different management practices and focus on improving your operation and the beef industry, this is the podcast for you. Welcome to the show. I'm so excited you are listening. Alrighty, folks, it is time for another episode of Casual Cattle Conversations. It's Shay here, and I am so excited and grateful to have you as a listener, whether you are new or a longtime listener. Today, we are going to be visiting with Mark Johnson, who is a professor at Oklahoma State University. And what Mark is going to talk about is creep grazing. So really, we're just looking at another management practice that may be beneficial um, from the profitability side, depending on your operation, but it's an alternative to creep feeding um, and might be another avenue for you to add a few more pounds to your calves um, before you sell. But Mark's really going to talk about the pros and cons of creep grazing versus creep feeding and what questions you need to ask yourself to see if this might be an opportunity worth exploring. Before we dive into that conversation, I do want to remind you that I am taking on speaking gigs. So if you need someone for a panel, a workshop, a keynote, I am happy to speak to your audience of cattle men or women, or even if you're a fellow podcaster and you want to learn more about that, I'm happy to discuss those opportunities. The best way to contact me about anything, whether that's speaking or just feedback about the show, or if you have a topic you want to hear about, is to head to my website, casualcattleconversations.com, and there's a contact us form. You fill that out, it goes straight to my inbox, and I will get back to you. But with that, let's visit with Mark. All right, Mark. Well, it is a pleasure to have you on the show today. I know I've read a few of your articles, and that's kind of how I came across you and the topic of creep grazing, which we're going to be discussing today. But before we dive into that topic, I'm curious a little bit about why you are passionate about your profession. So can you briefly talk about what you do today and why you chose this as your career? I could give a long answer to that, Shay. (laughs) But I, you know, I grew up in Southwest Missouri on a family farm and uh, it's a centennial family farm in Missouri. I would have been the one, two, fourth generation of Johnson's on that, on that homestead. And my father came back from the army. He was a sharecropper. And from the time I was old enough to be able to go with him to feed, I did. And he and I uh, were pretty much the labor force up to the time that I was 18. And we raised a lot of row crops. We had a lot of cows. Uh, We made hay. It was the what you think of as the traditional family farm and ranch. Uh, My mom was involved. My sisters were younger, but when they got old enough, they were involved. And so I always enjoyed all of that. But, but the thing that I was really passionate about was the cattle. And uh, so as I worked my way through life, went away to college and fortunate that I had the opportunity to come to Oklahoma state and go to college, I, I've just always had an interest in beef production and I enjoy trying to tackle solutions that would potentially unlock the profit potential of beef production or particularly cow-calf production. Commercial cow-calf production is what I grew up in. Uh, We didn't finish any cattle in my youth. We didn't run any stalkers. Uh, We ran a commercial cow-calf operation and I learned a lot from my father that it was important to use purebred bulls. And uh, this has always been at the age of 60, an interest to me to, to come at it from one angle or another, whether it's reducing input costs or trying to increase the value of the product we sell. That is my interest. Well, I think that's a very important interest and it's very important to as cattle producers to have people like yourself kind of on our side to help research and connect us with some of those ideas and management practices, whether they're new or maybe older and a little revamped to um, 
just connect us to those ideas so that we can improve the profitability of our operations and our lifestyle. So with that, we're talking about creep grazing today. Can you give a little bit of a background on what creep grazing is? Well, creep grazing is basically we we take a strip of pasture here or a lot that's you know, hopefully a little better quality grass. And maybe it's something we fertilized a little heavier, but we, we know that the quality, the protein content, the digestibility of that particular part of the pasture is going to be a little better. And we're essentially reserving it for calves to graze, probably putting up a creek gate there that they can get through, but the cows can't. And so they have got a source of forage that is of a little better quality that they can get to that the cows can't that should permit them to grow a little better or have a little more weight at weaning. So you mentioned that it might be higher quality grass. Mm -hmm. Um, Could it even be like a different... um, forage mixture that was planted or a cover crop or anything like that? Or exactly. what are some, what are some other options there? Can you share a few other examples outside of higher, just, here, you know, fertilized grass? Yeah. Here in Oklahoma, we would have like at, at my place, we have, a, we got a set of cows on a native grass pasture. And here across from that, we've got a Bermuda grass pasture. And so native grass calves would do really well on that, but You know, we get to a point in the summer by the end of June where the crude protein content of that native grass is going to go down. You can have those growing calves, say they're springborn calves that came in January, February, March. They they might have been able to gain really well, pound and a half, two pounds a day in May and June. But as we get to later summer, the protein content of that grass drops. It's going to work for the cows. But if we did something for the calves, that was, again, just a little better quality forage, we could keep those gains up and permit them to grow a little better. So what do we do at my place? What do we see done in Oklahoma? It may be something as simple as a Bermuda grass pasture where, you know, an improved grass, we actually put a little more nitrogen fertilizer on to keep that crude protein content up, keep it growing. And it could be something like cover crops. Um, We may go in and put in a sorghum sedan or potentially a millet, something like that. And, you know, an improved grass, better quality forage. Calves are the only ones that have access to it. And so uh, you you potentially get a little more bang for your buck out of that better quality forage. So calf performance sounds like it is the main advantage to creep grazing as it would be with traditional creep feeding. What other advantages do you see with the creep grazing model? Well, particularly if we compare it to just creep feeding. Let's say that we mixed a 14% crude protein growing ration for those young calves. Um, A lot of data has been collected over the years at land-grant universities, and they're going to hit that creep and, and they're going to get onto that ration and, and they're going to get to a point where they eat a lot of it. Now, in a commercial cow-calf operation, there are some downsides that come along with that. You, you get varying rates of feed conversion and therefore varying cost of gains as to, to what it is actually costing to put those extra pounds on a calf. In a market like we're in right now in 2024, uh, where a pound of a wean calf is worth quite a bit, that cost of gain, that is probably cost effective to put the extra weight on. Maybe. Uh, A lot of years, it's questionable whether or not that additional value of a pound of wean calf actually offsets the feeding the 14% growing ration ad lib. And so depends on the market to some extent. It depends on that rate of conversion, what your cost of gain is, putting that on calves. Then it also depends on some other factors where 
If those calves eat enough creep feed, they may put on the extra weight, but they may put on extra condition or fat so that by the time we're selling them, they're potentially selling back of the market because they are a little fleshier and fatter. So that's the downside that comes with it. And then just the realities of the market. Uh, the, the slide, if you will, the pay scale, a 400 pound calf is worth more per pound than a 500 pound calf. A 500 pound calf is worth more per pound than a 600 pound calf. And so as you add that additional weight, uh, the realities of the market are that that additional weight isn't always worth the same value per pound if you're selling a wean calf as it was when they were lighter. Furthermore, I, I'm giving a long answer to your question, but the other thing that we get into if we're going to creep feed a growing ration and let those calves have free access to it, ad lib and eat all of it they want, we got to have a feeder. We, we've got to have the feed in there so they got access to it. We got to have the feeder. Uh, the feeder's got to provide shelter so that the calves can get to it. And I'm sure in North Dakota, you deal with some of these same issues, but when you get that good rainstorm and a little bit of wind, you it's scary sometimes how much wet feed we might be out there mm -hmm. the next morning cleaning out of that feeder before it goes bad, molds, and you got to get that out or it might ruin a ton, two, two and a half tons of feed. So you got that fun issue to deal with on a full creep feeder. And it and doesn't then smell have, good to clean out rotten creep feed. No, <laughs> it's, it's not fun, but th that leads to the next point. Raccoons don't seem to mind. And so they'll get in and have fun. And, and I think possum are culprits here too. But, you know, they'll hop up in the trough of that creep feeder and they might rake out 50, 100 pounds of creep feed a night and that goes on the ground. And then you are you going to get that cleaned up? Can you manage to feed it to something else? So having that creep feeder out for a set of calves comes at an additional cost to the creep feeder. The added level of management of keeping the feed fresh, dry, cleaning it up after rainstorms keeping wildlife and rodents out of it so they don't just basically waste a lot of it. And creep grazing, you got standing forage out here that God bless cattle with a rumen, <laughs> the ruminant digestive system. So this is first nature for them. Nurse your mother, go eat grass. And by the time they're a couple months of age, that rumen's functional and they're perfectly equipped to go digest that grass. They can get that a little bit of extra gain, maybe not as much as a 14% growing ration, but they get a little extra gain without getting overly fleshy. And it tends to be more cost effective relative to all these other things that we're getting into. Okay. I'm glad you said that because that was going to be my next question is, does the creep grazing appear to be more cost effective in more scenarios than not? I know you mentioned there are a lot of factors that go into it. I think anytime we can put weight on cattle with grass, it uh, obviously there's times in beef production during the finishing phase, our objective is different, but, but anytime we are growing calves and we can put gain on them with grass and forage that they are harvesting themselves, as opposed to feeding harvested forage in the form of hay or silage, or as opposed to feeding a, a grain-based ration, we tend to be more cost-effective in about all cases. So I want to talk a little bit about the marketing side. So I know like if we decide to sell our calves through the barn, one of the questions that the sale barn manager may ask, you know, were these calves on creep feed when they were out in the pasture, you know, talking through how these calves were raised. Is that something that should be brought up if you do a creep grazing method? Because it's not a creep feeder. I would not think so, no. Yeah. I mean, they've been eating grass. Whether they were out in the same pasture with their mothers, eating milk and grass, or whether or not you had a creep graze strip for those calves to go into, either way, they've been growing on grass and forage. So when you are working with producers 
who might be looking to implement this method? Are they people who typically, are they selling off the cow? Are they backgrounding? Is it a mixture of both? Do you well, know? I, I think you could, you could, whether or not you creek graze probably doesn't impact your marketing, whether you're going to sell wean calves or run them until they're yearlings or retain ownership all the way through finishing. Okay. So I want to talk a little bit about the structure of how this is set up. So you, is it something where it could be like a single hot wire that the calves could go under, but would deter the cows? Is it a separate fence with, you mentioned like a creep gate? Um, how permanent of a structure is kind of required? Because we talk about that with rotational grazing too, with some of my guests, and that's the labor that goes with fencing. Mm -hmm. So what can come of some of those structures that, look like? That I've found to be most effective is just some kind of a simple creek gate. Same as we would put up, you know, maybe around the perimeter of a creep feeder, but we just go open a gate. We set our creep gate that's about eight foot wide and got our slots in here small enough and at a height that a growing calf could go through, but a cow can't. And so calves are typically pretty curious and investigate things a little more so than cows. So if you get that creek gate in there where they've got access, or for that matter, you could even structure something where you just put an open gap in a gate and secured it. The cow couldn't get through, but it was wide enough for the calf to get through. Those little rascals will find their way in there. And if they like what they got to eat, more of their buddies join them and, and, and they get access to it. But that's one of the upsides of creek grazing. You don't have to invest in the equipment the creep feeder you can keep it pretty simple and some means of just providing access to calves that a cow can't get through works and then the calves will do the rest so what are some of the main challenges that come with those first years of creep grazing because i feel like anytime we switch a management practice there can inherently be challenges or learning curves that come with it yeah, you know, I think a lot of it probably carries over. You mentioned rotational grazing, and you're going to have to have a certain part of a pasture or a trap that you you try to grow that grass in that only the calves have got access to. So probably, you know, fencing and just making sure you got the infrastructure in that regard is is really the thing that permits it to happen. So if someone is wondering if this management practice is something they should consider, what types of questions do you recommend they ask themselves? Oh, I think probably over time, you, you take a look at calves, you know, say you're a spring calving operation and uh, you're weaning calves at whatever point you do it, late summer or fall. If you're taking a look at those calves and feel like they've got a little more growth than what you tapped out of them, and they look a little thin, uh, and you figure, boy, they could have easily weighed another 50 pounds and, and still had a lot of compensatory gain left. Well, if you see that happen repeatedly over time and you're not in a drought, well, maybe you you, you go that route and, and try to uh, set up a management plan where they've got access to a little better pasture to tap more of that growth potential. So where can people go to find more resources about this topic? Well, I, I think we've got uh, probably most all the land grants have published extension fact sheets on creep feeding or creep grazing and the pros and cons of them. Uh, it would probably wouldn't hurt to check with agronomist and, you know, based on what part of the world you're in, what is maybe a, a good cover crop or something that, that forage that you want to try to grow for calves. And again, I get back to it. It can be as simple as you mentioned running a hot wire. We could go over here in any pasture and run a hot wire, cross it. So nothing's going to get past that barrier and maybe drive a couple posts and put our creek gate in over here in the corner 
to let the calves get in and the cows never do. And just so that you've got a part of that pasture that the calves have access to and, and they get to pick over the grass, you know, at first priority mm -hmm. and the cows aren't in there scavenging all the, the good stuff. Th those calves will tend to little, do a little better and pick up and have a little more gain by the time they're weaned. Mark, is there anything else we didn't talk about as it relates to this topic that you want to bring up? I would say this, Shay. The thing I like about creep grazing is that I always look for simple solutions and not to try to overly complicate management. And, and creep grazing can be a pretty low cost venture. And, you know, just something as simple as permitting those calves to get to some grass or forage that the cows can't. And so I, I like to think of it that way without a lot of additional management, without a lot of additional equipment or creep feeders that we have to buy. I think we can grow that forage a little more cost effectively that we can go get a, a grain ration put together. And so I see it as, as one of those opportunities. If, if it is probably more likely to fit a management schedule and not have to be as intensively managed as opposed to a creep feeder full of creep feed that again, back to those things we talked about takes a little more supervision and management to, and even here's the other thing, what have we not talked about? Sometimes it hasn't rained and you don't have a problem with, with rodents getting in and scraping out feed, but you go take a look at your creep feeder full of grain and you notice this one spot that's heaping up and nothing has uh, ate out of that spot. And a calf just accidentally urinated in it or turned around the wrong way and some manure got in it. And so that, again, is an additional headache with a creep feeder. So, you know, creep feeding grain can be a great thing, but penciling it out and thinking about all the things that go into it is something somebody should consider before doing that. Same as creep grazing, but creep grazing comes with a few less hurdles and management headaches if someone wants to pursue it. So one thing we didn't talk about was the size of the creep grazing area. I mean, are, do you just encourage producers to look at their own stocking rates for their pastures and the approximate size of their calves and just go off of that standard for animal units? Or is there another way cattle producers should be figuring the size I, no, of the creep I, I grazing think that area? Would... I think that would be a good idea. Uh, again, it doesn't have to be all that substantial. You know, depending on the size of the calves when they start, they don't need a lot there at the beginning, but something that's green and in the vegetative state that they have access to, uh, you can kind of play it by ear, but just to give them that little extra boost, it can be a pretty small area there at the beginning that you start with. That doesn't need to be a quarter section of grass just for the calves. Uh, if you got a 20, 30 cow operation, maybe they're running on a quarter section of grass and you just go over here and fence off three to five acres that the calves have access to. What age of calf do people start with creep grazing? I mean, is it kind of as soon as maybe people kick out to summer pasture. I mean, it's a different scenario in North Dakota, right? Because we don't always have grass um, until later May or early June that we want to kick out onto, depending on your grazing practices, unless you've really stockpiled some. So can you talk a little bit about when people usually start creep grazing in their time frame? The rumens, we always think that the rumen is functional by the time calves are two months of age. So you know, it, it could start as soon as that. It, we see baby calves mimicking their mother's behavior. And the, the, when they're still basically a monogastric and don't have a functional rumen, they're, they're ingesting grass and getting some nutritional benefit from it. So it can start early. Uh, probably, again, we think about spring calving operations, the heat of summer. Uh, when do you get the most bang for your buck? I mean, at, at any point, once their rumen is functional, you're, you're probably going to benefit. And so later summer, 
You might even want to accompany uh, access to a creek gray strip with little what we call Oklahoma gold, you know, a high protein supplement at a really low level that can bump those late summer gains up on growing calves too. So it, it can happen about any time, but I'd say two months of age and beyond is where you're going to get your most benefit. Okay. So a little bit of a fun and bigger picture question does not have to be related to the topic at all today, but in your career space, what are you excited about? Whether that's um, research management practices, just thinking about how producers are adopting changes, it could be anything. What are you excited about when you think about the future of the beef industry? Mm -hmm. Well, Shay, I tend to be excited about the beef industry a lot of the time, so I can wear people out with that. But, you know, right now, we I have talked about this for the past few months. We, this is an historically unprecedented time in my lifetime when we're, we've got a really low national beef cow inventory and a lot of reasons, a lot of things have went into that. And, uh, there is an opportunity to, to regrow cow herds and more tools at our disposal in terms of genetics to, to regrow a cow herd that is a better environmental fit to this part of the country or another part of the country. And so that's exciting. But the opportunity to do that in a market as robust as what we enjoy right now, and if we take a look at the amount of replacement heifers kept in the last three or four years relative to the amount of mature cows liquidated. It looks like this market is going to be around for a few years. Now, how rapidly we start holding back heifers and can get them into production, uh, that biological time lag that we have from, you know, identifying this weaned heifer calf that we want to turn into a cow before she actually has that first calf that we're going to sell a weaning, you've got a two year window there. So if we start to keep back more replacement heifers this year, which I anticipate we probably will, we're still looking at a national cow inventory that really can't get any bigger for at least two, three more years. And so the opportunity to enjoy these markets that we're in because of a low cow inventory, the a solid demand for beef, the product is going to keep these market values pretty solid for years to come. And as someone that enjoys beef production, I find that very exciting and something that I'm very happy to be part of because it is a long-term thing to be a cattle producer and have a set of cows and there are good years and there are years that doesn't matter what you've done, how good your management is, how solid your genetics are. In those years, it doesn't rain and you can never grow any grass or a bull goes bad or something goes off the rails that impacts the beef market in a negative way that didn't have anything to do with beef producers. You know, we live through those years to enjoy times like this. And so this is a fun time to be in the cattle business. Awesome. Well, Mark, thank you for taking time to be on the show today and share your knowledge. Shay, I appreciate you having me and uh, I've enjoyed it. All right, folks, that is a wrap on that one. Now, if you want more information, I did include a few links in my show notes. Additionally, if you want to kind of read the article and uh, skim over what we talked about in this podcast. I write an article that summarizes every podcast episode and that's on my website, which can also be found in the show notes. With that, have a great day and happy ranching.